What's going on, everybody? It's Scowling Out from the Podunk Punks here, and today we got uh, some more of the Analects of Confucius to go over. We're going to be hitting book three and book four today. But before we get too much farther in here, there is something I wanted to backtrack on. Um, it was an edict from book two. It was Edict 23. Um, Zizang asked whether ten generations hence could be known about. Uh, the master said the yin based itself on the Zhi ritual and what they subtracted or added may be known. The Zhao based itself on the yin ritual and what they subtracted or added may be known. The Zhao... Uh, the Zhao's possible successors, even in a hundred generations, may be known about. So, Master Kong here is going to, it's going to become more and more prevalent throughout the book that he just rattles off these, these names of cultures, ancient cultures, that don't exist anymore. And to leave you guys a little less bewildered when he goes on these kind of lists, um, I think it would be best to give you guys a little bit of background. So, if you guys don't want to hear the background, just get straight to the story, just skip a couple minutes, but uh, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of history here, just so that you guys, when you hear those names, won't be so awestruck. Um, so, Chinese legend has it that their society was crafted by a series of rulers that lived about 5,000 years ago. Uh, the first was uh, Fu Ji, the animal domesticator, I believe. Um, the second was Shen Nong. Uh, who taught agriculture, and the third was Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor, who uh, supposedly invented the Chinese method of writing at the time. And uh, so that's legend. The fact is, or what fact I could gather was, uh, Homo sapiens arrived in China around 4000 BCE in conjunction with the Great Migration out of Africa, and really began to dig in agriculturally around 8000 BCE. Uh, eventually giving rise to two Neolithic societies called the Yangshao and the Lungshan. Uh, then other cultures developed around the Yangtze Valley in central China and along uh, the southern coastline, but yeah. So shit crops up between the Yangtze and the Yellow River until you get about to 4,000 years ago, where the Xia dynasty gets founded. You know, they're uh, who historians really credit with truly kick-starting the Chinese culture, I guess. But uh, the Xia dynasty uh, was eventually replaced by the Shang Dynasty around 16th century BCE, uh, which is also known as the Yin Dynasty. So the Shang and the Yin. Um, they flourish until about the 11th century BC, where uh, some asshole Westerners called the Zhao crop up out of nowhere and overthrow the Yin. Uh, so the Zhao survive for 800 years, making it the longest lived dynasty in all of China's history, lasting from 1045 to 221 BCE. Um, the Zhao is where you get the Mandate of Heaven, which says that uh, the cosmos maintains order through the Zhao King, who isn't really a divine being, but is more of a representative of the divine, and it's his job to appease the gods by, you know, ruling through good grace and virtue and all that good shit, and if he appeases the gods, you know, you'll get good harvests and nice weather and dandelions and cuddles and sunshine, but anyway. Um, in the Zhao Dynasty, eventually there's a bunch of political strife and shit starts breaking apart and hitting the fan and you end up with uh, the Warring States period, which is exactly what the fuck it sounds like. Um, then around 221 BC, you know, um, the, the state of Qin rises up and just topples over the remaining Zhao Empire and they, they create a dynasty uh, that ends up conquering the other six of the seven combatants in the Warring States. Um, so now the Qin Dynasty uh, only lasted from like, I don't know, 221 to 206 BC, uh, which is 15 fucking years. But during that time, uh, he did a lot of shit that would continue to influence China, such as, you know, he standardized currency, uh, measurements, weights, writing, and a bunch of military and other shit. Um, he also burned a bunch of philosophical and political texts he didn't like, uh, which made us lose a lot of the juiciness that came from the hundred uh, schools of thought. And, you know, what is the hundred schools of thought, you might ask? It's basically the name for the Chinese Golden Age uh, in culture and philosophy that spanned from the 6th century to 221 BC when Du Xi Mc Quin Shi Huang Vi purged descent. Um, but anyway, during that time, you get Confucius, who arrived on the scene at 551 BCE as Master Kong, who pushed filial piety, aka respect for your parents and ancestors, um, the five bonds or relationships, which are, you know, ruler to ruled, father to son, husband to wife, elder brother to younger brother, friend to friend, um, 
And he also pushed the idea of a meritocracy, where rulers have to pass some kind of assessment before ruling. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, but anyway, all this brings into focus that edict from book two that I wanted to bring clarity to. So, one more time, now that you guys have the background, I'll read it off. Zizang asked whether ten generations hence could be known about. The master said the yin based itself on the Jia ritual, and what they subtract or add it may be known. The Zhao based itself on the yin ritual, and what they subtract or add it may be known. The Zhao's possible successors, even a hundred generations, may be known about. So he's saying all these people wrote their shit down, and we know everything about them for the most part, and it's possible that even the Zhao's possible successors, uh, even in a hundred generations, you know, may be known about. So... Yeah, he, he listed all these ancient cultures in a chronology, and I just feel before we moved on, he's going to do that more and more throughout the book, and yeah. Anyway, let's move the fuck on. Book three. Number one, Master Kong said, The G family has eight rows of dancers performing in the courtyard. If this can be endured, what cannot be endured? <laughs> <laughs> they must be some shitty fucking dancers. It's like, man, if I can sit through this, what, what the fuck can I sit through? Either that, or maybe they're like really sexy and he's trying to like, you know, practice his ways and be, you know, is conservative himself. And he's like, man, if I can keep my dick down there in this, what, what can I do? <laughs> well, let's move on. Number two, the three families cleared the sacrificial vessels accompanied by the young. The master said, in attendance are the lords and princes. The son of heaven is awesome and majestic. What has this got to do with the halls of the three families? Three, Master said, If someone is not humane in spite of being a man, what has he got to do with ritual? If someone is not humane in spite of being a man, what has he to do with music? Four, Lin Fang asked about the root of ritual. The Master said, An important question indeed. In ritual it is better to be frugal than lavish, but in mourning it is better to be sorrowful than unmoved. I like that a lot. He's saying, um, you know, in ritual, it's it's best to be frugal than lavish, meaning it's best to just do your thing and not show off, keep to yourself, you know, do what you have to do, show respect. But in mourning, it's better to be more persuaded by your emotions and be more outward than, than unmoved. So, I agree with that. Uh, number five, the master said barbarian people with rulers, barbarian peoples with rulers are not as good as the various Chinese states without them. Shit throwing that shade still. Uh, number six, the G family was sacrificing to Mount Tai. The master said to Ran Yu, can you not go to their rescue? I cannot, he replied. Alas and alack, said the master. Then do you mean that Mount Tai is as not as good as Lin Fang? He's like, bitch, you think you're better than them? You better fucking go back here. <laughs> number seven, the master said there's nothing, there's nothing which gentlemen compete over. If competition were inevitable, it would be an archery, wouldn't it? But they go up bowing and making way for each other, and when they come down, they have a drink, so even in their competition with each other, they are gentlemen. I like that too. You know, it's saying, even even in competition, you should be respectful, be a gentleman. Um, eight, Zishia asked the meaning of the lines, the entrancing smile dimpling, the beautiful eyes shining, plain silk which is made into finery. The master said, the decoration comes after the plain silk. Is ritual secondary, he said. Shang is the one who takes my point, said the master. Now it is definitely possible to talk about the songs with him. 9. The master said, The Jia ritual I can talk about, although the key is not worth taking as evidence. The Yin ritual I can talk about, although the song is not worth taking as evidence. This is because both documents and the men of learning are not adequate to be taken as a basis. If they were adequate, then I could take them as evidence. 10. The master said, at the D sacrifice, I do not wish to witness what comes after the libation. <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna get the fuck out of here, man. I'm gonna take this drink and move on, man. I don't wanna see what comes after this. 11. Someone inquired about the meaning of the D sacrifice. This is something I do not understand, said the master. The relationship to all under heaven of one who did understand its meaning would be like putting this here. And he put his finger on the palm of his hand. 12. Uh, sacrifice as if present means sacrifice to the spirits as if the spirits were in one's presence. But the master said, if I myself do not take part in a sacrifice, it is as if no sacrifice is made. Wang Sun Jia asked, uh, what is the meaning of better to fawn on the stove 
then to fawn on the southwest corner. The master said, It is not so. If you offend against heaven, there is no one to pray to. 14. The master said, Zhao observes the example set by two dynasties. So how splendid is its culture? And we take the Zhao as our model. I like that. He's saying, you know, they look, um, they, the Zhao sets an example by looking at two dynasties, and its culture is awesome. So he's saying, you know, they, they have a diverse culture. Diversity is, yay, diversity. Um, at least with those two cultures, anyway. Um, 15. When the master entered the Grand Temple, he asked about every single thing. Someone said, who says that the son of the man from Zhao knows the ritual? When he enters the Grand Temple, he asks about every single thing. When the master heard this, he said, this is the ritual. <laughs> so this guy's like, who's to say he knows anything about the ritual? I mean, he comes in here and just asks a billion fucking questions, and then the master looks straight at him, and he's like, that, this, this is the ritual, <laughs> bitch. 16. The master said, in archery, it was the way of antiquity not to stress the leather, because strength is not evenly matched. 17. Zygong wished to do away with the sacrificial sheep at the announcement of the new moon. The master said, See, you begrudge the sheep used in this, but I begrudge the ritual involved in it. 18. The master said, The full observance of ritual in serving a ruler is regarded by others as psychophancy. Uh, psychophancy. 19. Duke Ding. <laughs> Duke Ding. One more time. Duke Ding asked how rulers should employ ministers and how ministers should serve rulers. Master Kong replied, rulers in employing ministers should do so in accordance with ritual, and ministers in serving rulers should do so in accordance with loyalty. 20. The master said, in the Guanju, uh, they are joyful but not wanton. They suffer grief but are not harmed. 21. Duke Ai asked Zai Wo about the altar to the earth god. Zai Wo replied, saying, The Xia used the pine, the men of Yin used the cypress, and the men of Zhao used the chestnut, saying that it would make the people tremble. When the master heard this, he said, What is over and done with, one does not discuss. What has taken place, one does not complain about. And what is already passed, one does not criticize. 22. The master said, Guan Zong's capacity was small indeed. Someone said Guan Zong was thrifty, was he? He said Guanzong kept three establishments, and in his official business, he did not take over other people's duties. So how does he get the reputation for thrift? Nevertheless, Guanzong did understand the rights, didn't he? He said, Rulers of states erect gate screens, and Guan also erected a gate screen. Rulers of states, when they held a friendly meeting with another ruler, had a stand for inverted cups, and Guan also had a stand for inverted cups. If Guan Zong understood the rights, who does not understand the rights? 23. The master talked about music to the grand music ma uh, master of Lu, saying, Their music, insofar as it may be known about, tended to be in unison when they started to play. Following upon this, it was somewhat harmonious, clear, and unbroken. Right through until the end, it was finished. Right through until it was finished. My bad. Jesus. Um, 24. The boundaryman at Yi requested to be presented, saying, When gentlemen come here, I have never failed to get presented. The followers presented him, and as he came out, he said, What have you gentlemen to be disheartened at in his failure? It is a long time since the way prevailed in, in the world, but heaven is about to use your master as a wooden warning bell. So they're saying it's been a long time since the way prevailed in the world, but heaven is going to use your master as, as a warning bell, saying, Here it comes, bitch. Uh, 26. Last one for book three. Um, so open up this fucking pit. I want to see some move, man. This is our last edict. Yeah, of our fucking set until the next band comes on. Yeah. 26. The master said intolerance when occupying a high position. A reverence when performing a ritual and being unsorrowful in the conduct of mourning. How am I to contemplate these things? Thank you. Good night. We are book three. Analects. Now let me get some fucking water. God damn, it's cotton mouth, man. Mm-mm. Good water, let me tell you. H quality H2O, that uh that food lion brand generic water. <clears throat> now uh 
Let me also take a hit of my perfectly legal smoking tobacco here. Alright everybody, we're book four, and uh, this is our set of the Analects. <coughs> we want to see some fucking movement. <coughs> Number one, the master said, It is humaneness, which is the attraction of a neighborhood. If from choice one does not dwell in humaneness, how does one obtain wisdom? Two, the master said, It is impossible for those who are not humane to dwell for a long time in adversity and it is also impossible for them to dwell for long in pleasurable circumstances. Those who are humane rest content with humaneness, and those who are wise derive advantage from humaneness. I like that. And it's saying, you know, people uh, people who are humane, uh, they, they don't derive a lot of pleasure from... Uh, well, they, they don't dwell for a long time in pleasurable circumstances, um, and they're, not, they're, they're just content with being humane. Humaneness for humaneness' sake. Number three, the master said, Only one who is humane is able to like other people and able to dislike other people. Okay, so he's like, only one who's actually humane can be warranted in their like or dislike. Um, four, the master said, If one sets one's heart on humaneness, one will be without evil. <laughs> Easier said than fucking done, dude. Five, the master said, Riches and honors, these are what men desire. But if this is not achieved in accordance with the appropriate principles, one does not cling to them. Poverty and obscurity, these are what men hate. But if this is not achieved in accordance with the appropriate principles, one does not avoid them. If a gentleman abandons humaneness, how does he make reputation? If a gentleman never shuns uh, humaneness even for the right time it takes to finish a meal. Oh, the gentleman never shuns humaneness even for the time it takes to finish a meal. If his progress is hasty, it is bound to arise from this. And if his progress is unsteady, it is bound to arise from this. Phew, that was a mouthful. Six, the master said, I have never come across anyone who loved humaneness and hated inhumaneness. As far as anyone who loved humaneness is concerned, there would be no way of surpassing him. As far as anyone who hated inhumaneness is concerned, in his practice of humaneness, he would not let the inhumane come near his person. Uh, does there exist anyone who is capable of devoting his energies to humaneness for a single day? I have never come across a person whose energies were inadequate. Surely such people exist, but I have never come across them. So he's like, it's got to exist that, that there are people out there who just completely avoid inhumaneness. Surely such people exist, but I, I haven't come across them. That people who are 100% void of that. Uh, seven. The master said, people's mistakes all come in the same category, in that if one contemplates a mistake, then one gains an understanding of humaneness. Eight. The master said, if one has heard the way in the morning, it is all right to die in the evening. So he's saying, just let that be your peace. If you have heard the way in the morning, let that have been your zen. Um, nine. The master said, a public servant who is intent on the way, but is ashamed of bad clothes and bad food, is not at all fit to be consulted. 10. The master said, in his attitude to the world, the gentleman has no antagonisms and no favoritisms. What is right, he sides with. So he's saying he doesn't hate or favor anything, he just sides with what's right. Um, 11. The master said, the gentleman cherishes ver the th the gentleman cherish cherishes virtue, but the small man cherishes the soil. The gentleman cherishes the rigors of the law, but the small man cherishes leniency. Twelve. The master said, if one acts with a view to profit, there will be much resentment. Well, yeah. Have you ever met a fucking politician? <laughs> If one, asks with, if one acts with a view to profit, there will be much resentment. Yeah, you, you, you gotta be genuine. Don't just go out for, for money. I mean, make money, but don't let all your beliefs, you know, fall in line with making money. Um, 13. Uh, or you will be very hated by people. You know, people will hate you. People will see right through you. Uh, anyway, 13. 
the master said, if one can run a, if run thick, if one can run a country by making use of the differential attitudes influenced by ritual, what difficulty will there be? But if one cannot run a country by making use of the differential attitudes induced by ritual, then what point is there in ritual? So, yeah, um, stemming from differential attitudes and ritual, um, a lot of different opinions and perspectives uh, can, can be branched out upon. And, you know, you can't run a country by, by not making use of that, he's saying. You know, you got to have different perspectives of, of, seeing, a, of seeing certain things um, in order to run a country. 14. Uh, the master said, one is not worried about not holding position. One is worried about how one may fit oneself for appointment. Let me reread that. The master said, one is not worried about holding position. One is worried about how one may fit oneself for appointment. One is not worried about, one is not worried that nobody knows one. One seeks to become fit to be known. I like that too. It's just prepare yourself, you know, work on yourself before you just get there. You don't worry about getting there, work on becoming that which you want to be. Uh, 15. Uh, the master said, can. By one single thread is my way bound together. Um, Master Zhang said yes. When the master went out, the disciples asked, what did he mean? <laughs> master Zhang said, our master's way simply consists of loyalty and reciprocity. So that's a single thread. There's there's two ends to a, sing to a single thread. And that's, that's what the master said. My way is bound together through this thread. And when he left, they were like, what the fuck did he mean by that? And Zhang was like, he's just saying his way is loyalty and reciprocity. 16. The master said, The gentleman is familiar with what is right, just as the small man is familiar with profit. 17. The master said, When you come across a superior person, think of being equal to him. When you come across an inferior person, turn inwards and examine yourself. Hmm. 18. The master said, in serving father and mother, one re, re, remonstrates? remonstrates gently. If one sees that they are intent on not following advice, one continues to be respectful and does not show disobedience. And even if one finds it burdensome, one does not feel resentful. Okay. In serving mother, that, that's the filial piety thing. In serving mother and file, in serving mother and father, one remonstrates gently. If if he sees that they are intent on not following advice, one continues to be respectful and does not show disobedience. So he's just saying, be be obedient, be obedient, be obedient, even if it's burdensome, and if it's burdensome, don't show resent. Um, Nineteen. The master said, when father and mother are alive, one does not travel far, and if one does travel, one must have a fixed destination. So he's like, you don't go far away from your parents, and if you do, you better know where the fuck you're going, and it better be for a good reason. 20. The master said, if for three years one makes no change from the ways of one's father, one may be called filial. So he's saying, grow up to be just like your father. If in three years it can be said that you haven't made a change from, from your father's way, you can be filial, or considered to be so. Uh, 21. The master said, the age of one's father and mother should not be unknown. On the one hand, so that one may rejoice, and on the other hand, so one may feel anxiety. I like that a lot. You know, the age of one's father and mother should be, should not be unknown. You should know it. So that way, in one hand, you know, it's like they're this old, I've had them for this long, I'm going to have them for this much longer. On the other hand, you know, it, it should be a constant reminder that nothing lasts forever. You know, you, you should have that healthy anxiety, you know, um, healthy level of anxiety. 22. The master said, the reason why words were not readily uttered in, in antiquity was because people were ashamed that they personally would not come up to them. 23. The master said, there are few indeed who fail in something through exercising restraint. Huh. That's, that's more him, just, you know, his, his conservatism. And I, I say conservatism completely removed from, from what it is today. I literally just mean conservatism as in he's being more you know, conservative with himself and his, his values. They're more revolved around not being promiscuous and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he's saying that there's, there's little that can be done through exercising restraint. 
Uh, 24. The master said, The gentleman wishes to be slow in speech, but prompt in action. So he's saying, speak deliberately. Something that I'm fucking having a hard time reading this. <laughs> um, 25. Uh, the master said, Virtue is not solitary. It is bound to have neighbors. <laughs> so he's saying, you know, if, if you're virtuous, you're, you're going to have other people. And it's going to rub off on people. You know, one of those things I... I guess this is a stretch, but it's one of those things where, you know, you help somebody out, they might help somebody else out, and they might help somebody else out, and together it just brings the whole community to a fucking sunshine and, you know, wonderful fucking rainbowy place. Uh, 26, last one. Uh, Ziyu said, if one is censorious when serving one's ruler, then one falls into disgrace, but if one is censorious with one's friends, then one becomes estranged. Hmm. So, I guess he's saying, if I'm getting this word correctly, censorious, censored, you know, I'm taking the, the root word from that. Um, if, if you're going to censor yourself when serving one's ruler, then you fall into disgrace. But if you censor yourself around friends, you, you become estranged, you know, they, they, you, you shouldn't censor yourself, period. Um, anyway. That was book three and book four. Thank you for listening. Jeez Louise. Why don't you all take a hit with me here? So, next week, we're going to go over book five and book six. And uh, we're going to keep trucking through this. It's, it's a pretty short book, and I think we can, uh, we can get through it pretty, pretty damn quickly if I keep doing it two at a time here. So... Um, I think it only goes up to 20 books. Yep, 20 books, and there's some explanatory notes at the end, which is just extra bullshit. And I said, if you guys want extra bullshit, then I gave you the title of a book already. You can go fucking buy it yourself and read it. Anyway, I'm Scowling Al. Thank you very much. This has been my presentation on Confucius the Analects, and I hope you like it very much. Donate to our Patreon. Um, our, our microphones are always breaking. I have to bitch about that every single time. Um... Thank you. Good night.